Up to now, I've told you about the sort of status of the Arctic sea ice. And in the past, I've made some predictions about when I would expect the first blue ocean event to occur. And I still think there's a high probability of, of it occurring, you know, within the next uh, few years to five years. But I want to show talk about what some other people are saying. So I'm going to talk about some papers on that are looking at predicting the future of Arctic ice. So this is uh, NOAA, the National Centers for Environmental Information, and there's this article that was posted recently about a new study suggesting climate models may underestimate the rate of melting. No surprise there. So there's a new paper in the journal Climate that suggests the Arctic may be essentially ice-free during summer within 15 years. So I'll talk about that paper in detail. And there's a caveat. It's saying that the models um, are, there's, there's room for improvement in the models. The ice may disappear even more quickly than the current model suggests. So even more quickly than within the next 15 years. You know, and it says what scientists refer to as the first ice-free Arctic summer year. First ice-free Arctic summer year, FIASI. What kind of acronym is that? I mean, they don't want to use blue ocean event, which is a, which is a term that I coined, of course, because they want to use their own, their own acronym. So let's keep using blue ocean event. This acronym is, is useless. FIASI, it doesn't even, you know, it's a terrible acronym. But anyway, that will occur when the Arctic is less than 1 million square kilometers of ice. It says the ice sheets surrounding Canada's Arctic islands are likely to remain for much longer. And this is, I think, is complete hogwash. I think the only ice left will be circling around the North Pole. Nowhere near, it won't be fast ice on shores because those are at much lower latitudes. I think that's pretty obvious. And I'm not sure why the scientific community is still acting like they don't understand uh, optics and uh, thermodynamics or you know much else um, anyway this is this is what they what they say they also refer to the arctic report card which i'll talk about and they talk about um, the one thing that they really miss out on is they don't emphasize all of the you know the ex great increase of extreme weather events severity duration and uh, occurrence of them is greatly increasing because of the disappearing sea ice they talk about silly things like some penguins, people up there, and oil, you know, different uh, economic opportunities up there. They don't talk about how the lack of, uh, you know, the complete craziness of the jet streams will wipe out the food supply. But anyway, um, so they talked about uh, different studies here, 12 different climate models. Under the high emission scenario, the model suggests it could happen in 2042. Uh, one model says 2023, although they, the authors say that's probably unrealistic. You know, we'll see. I'm not so sure. Um, so, you know, there's an earlier study that's talked about, and I'll also talk about that in detail. So let's get right to these uh, studies here. So this is the recent study, okay, the, the first study here. This is the... Now, and a new paper in the journal Climate that says the Arctic may be ice-free during summer within 15 years. So let's have a look at it. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, you can definitely, it's, it's open source. So just click on the link, just Google the title, just bring it up yourself and have a look at it. I'll talk about some of the key factors from these 12 models. So, so they do 12 models to predict things, and then they also do statistical models to look at the, the ice data, you know, rather than use the, um, the, the computer models trying to simulate everything, right? They look at the data and do statistical analysis, and there's, you know, different fits, so exponential, Gompert, log, quadratic, and I've shown you many of these curves in the past. Um, so this is uh, what they show here is this series. This is the sea ice extents, historical, historical. So up to, so from the 1800 to 2005, that's in these um, models. Okay, so September, uh, so less and less ice is the yellow. Okay, this is the, uh, this is the uh, sea ice extent, 10 to the 6 square kilometers, million square kilometers. Okay, so it's showing the, um, the model showing 
you know, it's it, it, the the amount of ice. So yellow is September, the melt month, and you can see some of the models when you back model, they show uh, you know rap, uh, like lots of loss in September, but not too much change over the years. Okay, and then you use a medium emissions scenario, RCP 4.5. So these are the different models. These are the 12 different models. And they show the sea. So this shows less than a million square kilometers is the black line. So they show this model, for example, shows it happening in about 2055, you know, and being sporadic and then picking up and being every year from about 2080 on and so on. So we can look at the range of models. This seems more realistic to me out of all of these. Okay, so the first loss, um, total loss of sea ice in September may be occurring about 2023. This is a 2023 model. And then happening, you know, not, you know, ver having variability for a while and then completely disappearing in the early 2030s and, and being that way every year and getting to longer. And as this thing gets wider, it extends out into the different months of the year. Okay, so it shows how, how it's projected under the mid-range scenario. Um, what I have said is that I would expect within about 10 years, it's, it's, there's no sea ice year round. And this is showing that it takes much, much longer than that. Let's have a look at the high emission scenarios. So this is RCP 8.5. Okay, so now you can see these models and you can see the curves widening rapidly. So let's have a look. You know, so let's look at this guy, for example. So this is showing, what this is showing is the sea ice declines each September. And in early, this is 2040, 2030. So maybe 2033 or 2032, you get the sea ice being under a million square kilometers for the first time in the Arctic, according to this model. And then you can see how this thing widens. So by 2070, there's no sea ice from about uh, June through December, but there's still sea ice in the winter month. And then as you go on, it's projecting into 2100, there's basically no sea ice from, this is uh, March, this is April. So sometime in April, back to uh, January, beginning of February, no sea ice and then sea ice just for a couple of the months here in between. That's what this model is projecting, but that would be by 2100. So have a look at all of these, and that's basically what the models are projecting. So, um, you know, but the models are missing things. So they're saying it could be faster than this. This is showing some plots here, showing the sea ice extent in March, you know, historical up to, you know, 2005, and then the R45 projection to 2100 and the R85 projection. So dropping less and less in the winter, but this is in September, the historical data. And then this is showing the R45 projection and the R85. So going to, you know, each of these is model runs and you can see some of them coming down very, very quickly. They're taking the average of all the runs and they're staying, you know, there's still going to be ice around for a while. Okay, so that's interesting to, to look at. Um, and then there's more uh, data here, more details and things, but I think I've shown you the key things, um, the key things from this paper. Okay, uh, so, yeah, I've shown you the key things. And then the paper that was referred to earlier is here. It's by the same author. So, so look at this Arctic sea ice trends and projections, February 2018, North Carolina Institute for Climate Studies. And I'll show you some of the key things in here. This is a trend, if you, forget, if you fit a linear regression over time, so in the last 20 years, okay, you can see it's sloping down. And then you can take these and expand the time scale and you get the projection based on the last 20 years trends. And if they're linear, then you still get these sort of time frames, 20, 20 uh, 45 for the disappearance and so on. But ice free is less than a million square kilometers, so it would be a bit earlier, 2035. But this is linear models, of course. It's not, you need to compare the different, so this is a key figure here in the paper. 
Um, this is, uh, if you take the 1979 to 20, 2008 line, right, take that data and do a f model fit, statistical fit, and then, uh, you know, take a, mo a more recent record and a more recent record and a more recent record, then you can see the data is converging. So if you take the data, the, the, the sea ice data from 86 to 2015, and you do your different fits, this is a linear fit, ice going by 2048 or so, the exponential curve uh, by 2032 or so. And then the models, so the models are converging here, so the mean here is something like 2038. But, you know, the drop-off does seem to be exponential. Gompertz, you know, exponential down, but sort of tailing up and so on. So this is where, this is sort of the most recent data, which, and, and you can go into this paper, it's called Sensitivity Analysis of Arctic Sea Ice Extent Trends and Statistical Projections. And uh, there's other figures in this paper. You know, here's the different statistical models and there's different, there's other data, you know, it looks at it in great detail. But I think that the gist of it is this curve here, these projections, and uh, you know, here's the different curve fittings um, and uh, for, for recent data. And you can go down and they have this image here. I think these are the key images here. Okay, this is a key image of the fits. So taking the different time periods of data and then doing your statistical fits. These are the numbers that you get. And you can compare that to the numbers that the computer models get that aren't based on the statistical data. So you can get an idea for what's going on. And also, this is the Arctic report card update. And I haven't really talked about this. It came out not too long ago. Um, this is the... Uh, this is the uh, the whole thing, and I think I should probably do separate videos on that. Uh, but I'd be amiss if, remiss if I didn't talk a bit about the uh, coronavirus here. So this is the Johns Hopkins uh, site now. I didn't update it. I updated it when I did my last videos. But uh, this so this was um, this this is the numbers from March thirtieth, twenty twenty, at four twenty p.m. Today is April 2nd at about the same time. It's actually 4.50 p.m. So we're talking about three days. So I wrote down these numbers. 775,306 is the world. U.S. 159,000. Canada, where I live, 7310. And let's do an update. Okay, here we go. So the world has gone from, in three days, the world's gone from 775, 775,000 to over a million cases, okay? So you can work out that percentage increase. You know, it's about, what, 25%, uh, actually more like 30%, 35% increase in cases in three days. So you could argue with exponential growth that this number is going to increase by... 30% in the next three days. So April, April 5th, about this time, um, this will be 1.3 million cases. The U.S. is 236,000 cases. Three days ago, it was 159,000 cases. Take the ratio, 236 to 159. That's the percentage growth rate over three days. Multiply that by this number, and that will tell you how many cases there will be in three days in the US. If it's lower, then that means the growth rate is dropping. So this is how you, you, know, you look at exponential growth. You get a constant percentage increase over a given time period. Canada, 10,182 cases. It was 7,310 cases a few day, uh, three days ago. So in three days, you know, this is a growth rate. This is a huge growth rate because Canada took in, you know, we started turning the curve, um, but the curve is continued to ramp upwards here. This is the, the red line is Canada. We started turning the curve here, but all the, you know, millions of people, million people, million, you know, many, many people are coming back to Canada from other countries. And as long as that continues to happen, this growth rate is going to keep going in spite of our social distancing and distancing and physical distancing. You know, I talked a few videos ago about when there's a plague, stay in your own country. And if you're in another country and there's a plague, stay in that country. 
That was ancient wisdom and nobody is following that. So, you know, we still have people and planes pouring into Canada with people from um, coronavirus stricken regions. And 